So I would like to get started because technology is, is always a work in progress and it's working right now. So we'd better start right now as it's working. So I'll, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Allison Alexi. Allison Alexi is an associate professor at University of Michigan's Women and Gender Studies Department with unerring instincts for making our intellectual community better. She has been editing a series for University of Hawaii Press, Asia Pop, that has been steadfastly reshaping contemporary understandings of Asian popular culture. She's also started a podcast, Michigan Talks Japan, which is a model for how to use podcasts as a medium for drawing attention to some of the most interesting work being currently done in the field. Every time I chat with Allison, I learn about innovative approaches to teaching and to intellectual community building. So it's a bit too impressive that this is also the same person who has been steadfastly breathing new life into a classic focus in anthropology, kinship, while diplomatically pointing out what scholars of anthrop in anthropology have missed all these years by not turning their attention to divorce. She also sh she shows the rest of us how much light can be shed on the relationship between large scale economic changes or legal systems and people's daily experiences by looking at moments in which families are disconnecting. She has become a figure to cite in a large scale movement in anthropology, looking at disconnections, at ignorance, at emptiness, at the moments in which social orders are openly revealing their gaps and their incompleteness. So Alison Alexi is very much a rarity in anthropology, a dame of disconnection. And it is my great pleasure to welcome her to Rice. Uh, so I've never been roasted, but I feel like that is the most roasty introduction I have ever. It's just enough to mortify me, uh, hopefully mortify some other people in the room so we can all be mortified together. Thank you so much, Alada. That's incredibly kind. I've truly never been called a dame before. <laughs> having, having never performed in Guys and Dolls, I've never been called a dame. Um, I'm going to move the chair. Thank you so much for that tremendously kind of, she did warn me beforehand that she was planning on trying to embarrass me, I believe is the way you said it. So um, fair enough. <laughs> Mortify. Hey, that worked too. Um, so thank you all so much for that. Alana, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you all for having me here. It's truly my pleasure to be able to share some of my work with you and to be able to think together. I look forward to your questions, comments, reactions, ideas, anything you care to share. Um, so in addition to Alana, I'd like to thank Sonia. Where did you go? Oh, the, oh, there you are. Okay, great. Um, for such a wonderful introduction um, and invitation. And for all of you, it's been a wonderful visit so far. Um, I've actually never been to Texas before. I mean, other than like changing planes occasionally. Um, and so that feels like a, a really big deal as, a, as a, my first visit. So I really want to thank you all. Um, I would also like to thank the Department of Transnational Asian Studies and the Chow Center for Asian Studies for hosting me um, and for funding this visit. Thank you very much. Um, hey, Hyun Matos, where did you go? Oh, there, thank you, thank you. Who just fixed the tech by calling someone, which was amazing. You did it with your soul. I felt you do that. Um, and Amber Simzik, who is on, on Zoom, fixing things on Zoom. So thank you also, Amber. Um, I also want to say I grew up, so I've never been to Texas before, but I grew up in South Carolina. Um, and actually, this weather is like in my bones. Does that make any sense at all? So I looked at the, the weather today. It's five degrees cooler in Charleston, where I grew up, than here. But it's like completely recognizable to the soul of my body, this weather, this humidity and the heat, all of it. So it feels like such a welcoming sort of homecoming for me. Does that make any sense at all? OK, if you grew up someplace humid, it, it feels different, right? A little bit. OK. Um, so by way of introduction, um, Alana mentioned some of this, but I just wanted to take an opportunity to share a little bit of my academic work. Um, let's see if this will work. OK, great. So here's a book I wrote a few years ago about divorce in Japan. I'm actually sharing this 
mostly so that you can know that it's available through open access. So if you're really into the idea of reading a 200-page PDF about divorce in Japan, I can give you a free copy. <laughs> um, so you can download it. Do not buy the electronic version. It is free. Chicago kind of hides it a little. You have to click through a second click, but it is there. Um, so I'm really excited. I am sort of making a joke, but I'm actually really excited to be able to publish through open access. That feels like a really important um, move that many of us are trying to make. Um, I might move this up so I can, excuse me. Um, and then also the book has been translated into Japanese um, and I wanted to take this opportunity to share, um, the, this is unfortunately not open access. Let's see if I can move this a little bit. Um, but the translator is uh, Dr. Takeshi Hamano, who's an amazing sociologist of Japanese families, and he has published his own work in English. This is his English book um, about Japanese women who migrate to Australia. So given um, people in this audience, I thought some of you might be interested in that as well. Um, the Chinese translation um, was co-translated um, by one of the translators, Xin Yanpeng, who uh, is a UVA graduate, anthropology, um, has also published her own book called Corporate Women in Contemporary China, quote, we have always worked. So again, I'm basically trying to use this opportunity to popularize and pitch their work as well. So if you're interested, um, these are wonderful people um, who are not at all primary, tr primarily translators. Um, I also co-edited a book called Intimate Japan that is available through open access. So if you're thinking about intimacy, um, and again, you like to read a 200-page PDF, um, feel free to grab this. Um, if you Google the title, it should come up pretty quickly. And here are the, the series that Alana so kindly mentioned. Again, my, my intention here is not to be braggy, but to share other people's extraordinary work. Um, so most of the books, um, all of the books are about East Asia, or, um, and we have increasingly some um, more books about South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, so if you're interested in pop culture, um, if you eventually think you might want to publish a book, please don't hesitate to reach out. It's, it's a really fun series. Okay. So today, my talk focus, focuses on what's often called parental abduction, which occurs when one parent takes their own child and restricts access to the other parent. As a framing, I want to acknowledge that my presentation will include topics and scenarios that can be very difficult to hear. Conflict and violence within families, children abducted or rescued by a parent, parents and children losing all contact with each other and gendered violence. I do my best to present my work to honor the myriad people who were so generous to tell me about some of the worst moments of their lives. I also want to acknowledge that our group today includes survivors. So in this room and on Zoom, surely there are survivors with us, either what are called left behind parents or other family members, abducted or formerly abducted children, or people with personal experiences of family conflict. And I have designed this presentation with people, those people in mind. Thank you all for being part of the conversation, especially if you've had some kind of personal experience with any of this. If anyone needs to leave the presentation temporarily or permanently, please do so. Follow your own needs. I promise I will never be offended or upset if you get up and leave. As an entree point, I'd like to notice Shin Noguchi's photograph of two children in a koban because it engages some of the themes of the, my larger project. For those of you who aren't familiar, koban are often glossed as police boxes in Japan and are small, booth-like buildings where a police officer is always supposed to be on duty. If you do a Google image search for koban, you get results that are neutral to cheerful. The image on the bottom right comes from a website posting literally website posting literally titled Japan's, oh, you can't see it. Let's see. I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting. Is there a way to minimize this bar? Does anybody know Zoom? There is a way, isn't there? Hide, float. Look at us. Look at us. This is amazing. Okay. So the caption there, or the title there, was Japan's streets are safe and secure thanks to Koban. Um, surely half of you are immediately thinking, safe for whom exactly? We know racial profiling exists in Japan, and I expect that many of us often know anyone wanting to report groping in particular faces some, oops, some real chance um, that they will be, that their claim will be dismissed and ignored. Hmm. 
Oh, you know why? Let's try this again. There it is. Um, so this is the number you can call. This is a poster in the trains to, re to report groping. Ito Shiori's memoir, Black Box, adds another very pointed question, dismantling Japan's simplistic reputation for safety. So if you don't know her, she's a Japanese journalist, right? Very famous because she won a case against um, somewhat a, a more senior and famous uh, a journalist who raped her um, and then denied it. So this is her memoir talking about this. Within this context, as it becomes obvious that Japan's reputation for safety requires erasing and ignoring much gendered violence, I appreciate Noguchi's photograph because it feels both unsettled and unsettling to me. Maybe it feels different, different to you. I think it's possible that the police officer that we see only as a hat is truly helping the two children, but I am far from sure about that. I can't think of many situations um, to explain this image in which something happy, good, or particularly safe has happened. And the photo photographer's placement of the door's frame across the children's faces perfectly anonymizes the subjects while leaving me, at least, with more questions. The visual link between children and law enforcement is jarring. Before I go on, I want to ask, does anybody else have something that they want to point out about this image? It's not a trick question. Something that you're noticing that feels striking to you or a question. Yeah, please. Thank you, thank you for that. My presentation today explores what is often called parental abduction. Parental abduction within Japan occurs within Japan and internationally to Japan with some frequency and has drawn growing political and media attention in recent years. These highly controversial cases involve one parent taking their own child or children and restricting access to the other left behind parent often for many years. These can be international abductions to, into Japan um, or domestic abductions involving one parent removing a child from the other parent entirely within Japan. Although some people label these as kidnappings, others understand them as rescues or escapes. And many of the cases include, include accusations of violence within the family, i.e. this is something that someone needs to be rescued from or escaped from. In this presentation, I mirror the terminology used in, in the international convention that most directly impacts these cases, and therefore I call them abductions. I'm not trying to claim that that's a neutral word, but I'm mirroring right now a legal structure. So I'm happy to talk more about um, terminology. As a side note, which we can get more into in Q&A if you want, the word abduction in Japanese, rachi, has a very different context. Um, and is actually about ab abductions of Japanese citizens to North Korea. Um, so the abduction problem in Japan is one that is very much associated with North Korea specifically um, and particular cases. So one of the most famous abductees is Yokota Megumi, and these are her parents. Um, her father has, has passed away um, in the last two years. Um, and so sort of these images of, of abductions, this is the kind of association um, with that particular word. Um, and some of the people that I worked with, actually uh, some of the foreigners, non-Japanese that I worked with, were trying to sort of shift the meaning of rachi, shift the meaning of abduction, which I think basically went nowhere. Um, so here's, here they, they are talking with um, then President Bush. Okay, so because of the contested nature of these conflicts, statistics are unclear, but suggest that many thousands of children have been moved into Japan without permission from one parent and tens of thousands of uh, children are taken within Japan. I'm happy to talk more about the specific numbers, but for reasons that will become increasingly obvious over the course of this presentation, they're actually very difficult statistics to be able to get. Although recent legal changes are reshaping these dynamics, 
in matters of child custody, disputes, or abductions, at this moment in time, at this particular moment, the Japanese family law system does not typically attempt to recover children who have been abducted by a parent or other family member. In practical terms, any child brought into Japan or moved within Japan can be lost to the parent who doesn't hold de facto custody. So not legal custody, but custody and practice. No matter legal agreements reached in other nations or to a large degree, even legal agreements reached within the Japanese court system itself. All right. In this presentation, I will try to explain what is going on, how these patterns could be possible, but also try to situate Japan within global conflicts and currents. This is my attempt to engage the department's commitment to transnationality in particular. Japanese family law is the focus of global attention to a degree that might be surprising. Examining Japanese family law contextualized within inter international family law in the project more broadly, I argue that the centrality of family as an organizing symbol for the Japanese nation and the ensuing legal system that privileges families as unimpeachable private space creates fundamental lacuna for people seeking assistance in family disputes. Since Japan's creation as a modern nation in 1868, this is an, a, re a representation of the imperial family around that time, families, both li literal and symbolic, have been at the center of the nation. Amidst discourse describing Japan as a family nation, popular ideologies suggest the national polity as a large family at the same time that laws rendered only certain family forms acceptable. So there's only certain ways you could legally structure your family. Explicitly articulating such ideals, Japanese prosecutors told me that they don't want to use law to solve family problems, kazuku mondai, because the family is too important and too private. This project, broadly, explodes the assumptions within such statements, asking what law can do for people struggling with family conflicts and how families respond to disputes when law is an unhelpful mechanism. Using parental abductions as a starting point, I theorize the relationship between law and family within and beyond Japan, although today I will be focusing mostly on Japanese cases. The research on which this presentation is based started 10 years ago, when I spent 12 months in Japan, the United States, and the Netherlands. In these locations, as well as online, I joined advocacy meetings and protests and interviewed so-called left-behind fathers and mothers and grandparents advocating for the return of their grandchildren, as well as lawyers, diplomats, and politicians. The research continues because family law in Japan, and custody law in particular, have been something, become something of a moving target, with new proposals and possible changes coming online as possibilities in the last few months even. I'll talk more about the recent um, changes <sighs> towards the end of the talk. To bring this all into concrete and personal terms, let me narrate two representative examples of parental abduction. These are both real stories, but I have slightly shifted some details. In each case, I heard the story and learned the story from the left behind parent. Marcus is a white German man who had moved to Japan a decade before we met. He worked in tech and originally moved for a temporary position but fell in love with a Japanese woman and decided to remain in Japan. He and his wife had two children and lived in the suburbs of Tokyo. As he told me, they had a perfectly normal life. He worked to support the family and his wife was primarily responsible for their young children. They had disagreements and they fought, but nothing that felt unusual or unreasonable to Marcus. He thought his wife wasn't happy, maybe, but they were trying. One evening, he came home from work and ate dinner with the family as usual. Looking back, he said nothing felt particularly out of the ordinary, but he also wasn't really expecting anything or looking for anything. He got in the shower, and by the time he came out, his wife and children were gone. He realized later that his wife had packed bags for them and was ready to go, but this was breathtaking and sudden. By the time he told me the story, many years after it happened, it felt like he was prepared for his listener's shock 
that his wife left him and took the kids while he was in the shower. He, know, he knew it sounded unbelievable and kind of insane, but that's what happened. Eventually, he heard from his in-laws that his wife wasn't returning. When I last spoke with him, he was still legally married, but hadn't seen his children in years, and was living and working in Japan in order to try to advocate for legal change, potentially see his children. Marcus's example is unusual in its extremity, but mirrors many similar stories of left behind parents in Japan. In broad brushstrokes, the experiences often include a very sudden and unexpected disappearance of the taking parent and children, little to no contact between the left behind parent and children after that, and no willingness by the police or court system to quote, remove or recover a child taken by a parent. David is a Chinese American man raised in the United States. While living in Japan for work, he met and married a Japanese woman, eventually having a daughter together. Their marriage was happy and loving. When their daughter was very young, they moved to Singapore for David's job. While there, his wife began to feel sick, and was eventually diagnosed with an extremely aggressive cancer that ended her life within two years. It was awful for everyone. David's daughter was eight years old when her mother passed away, and he struggled for many reasons, including working while also caring for her, and mourning, of course. One summer, David's in-laws, his wife's parents, offered to take their granddaughter for a vacation. David was thrilled with the idea, especially because it was important to him that his daughter stay connected with her Japanese heritage. When it came time for David's daughter to return home, her grandparents simply refused to let her go. David was stunned, as I imagine all of us would be. It took him many months to understand the logic, which was that they could provide a better life than he could as a working parent, or maybe as a working father. And then it took many, many years before he acknowledged that the law was on their side. Simply put, Japanese custody law prioritizes consistency and often grants legal custody to the person with whom the child has been living. This case is extreme because such priority was given to people other than a parent, but as a practice, it is not wholly uncommon. I think at this point I want to pause and just ask if anyone has a comment or question or just wants to voice any feelings. I'm sorry, it's so sad. Yes. So, because you're, you're thinking about how long they've had custody, is that what you're thinking about? Yeah. yeah. So what happened was, um, no. But by the time David reached out to law enforcement, she had been with them for about eight months. So it wasn't like she had been spending time. She went basically for the summer. Um, but he didn't, I mean, I'm not blaming him at all. Quite reasonably, he didn't think, oh, I should go to the police and say, right? And so by the time... Um, he did and tried to get her removed or recovered. Um, it had been, I don't want to say too long because it's not like there's a particular point, but it had been long enough that the grandparents could make the case that she is, grown, the daughter has grown accustomed or the granddaughter has grown accustomed to life with them. Um, I'm not in any way trying to imply that this is fair. Does that answer your question? Yes. Do you want to add anything else? No, I just, eight months was longer than I was Yes, exactly, and it wasn't originally supposed to be that. My understanding was originally supposed to be summer, right? Um, and and then it got extended. Did you? Did, no, nothing. Other feelings? Anybody? Anybody feeling really sad or angry? I feel like that's fair. Okay. Um, parental abductions and particular strategies responding to them are impacted by the structure of and requirements within Japanese child custody law. At the moment, Japan does not have joint legal custody, excuse me, joint custody. When parents of a minor child decide to get divorced, the custody of that child must be held by a single individual. Maybe importantly, if you're married, you can share custody. So there's joint shared custody when you're married, but as soon as you get divorced, you don't have it anymore. There is no legal joint custody in Japan, although many people calling for exactly this change. 
In the present moment, as a result of parental agreements and court orders, more than 80% of custody is granted to mothers. Um, so mothers in this case, custody granted to mothers here are in sort of yellow bars um, and green bars are the father gets custody and other person is the red bar. Um, the, the sort of bluish line at the top um, is the sort of total number of divorces, which is sort of going up and down. Um, if I extended this back further to so say 1900, fathers would be getting custody even more, right? So um, basically you can see that fathers being granted custody are decreasing, mothers being granted custody are, are increasing to the point that about 86% of custody these days is legally granted to mothers. Although some families design ways to keep a non-custodial parent in touch with their child, those informal arrangements are not supported through legal means and cannot be challenged in court. If, a former, if former spouses develop a plan for de facto joint custody, de fa uh, joint custody in practice, and one parent reneges, the parent not holding legal custody has very few options. In practice, this means that a non-custodial parent can only stay in contact with their child at the whim of the parent holding legal custody. If an informal shared custody agreement breaks down, the formal court system is unlikely to help parents rebuild it. I want to emphasize that it's not technically accurate to say that there is no joint custody in Japan. There's no legal support for sharing custody of a child. But if parents are able to work it out on their own, there's no prohibition against it. In my first book, I write about divorced parents who are actively and intentionally maintaining shared custody. It certainly can be done. All that said, in the contemporary moment, a recognizable, if not common pattern, describes contact between children and non-custodial parents as potentially confusing and psychologically painful for the children. I call this the clean break mentality. And a prominent example comes from former Prime Minister Koizumi um, on the left, who's a conserv very popular conservative Prime Minister um, from the early 2000s, and his ex-wife Miyamata Kayoko and their three sons. The older two sons have not seen their mother since the parents divorced, while the younger son has apparently never met his father because he was in utero when the divorce happened. My point here, um, and I write much more about this in the book, is that he's a conservative politician, right? So that this, this signals to us that this is not the only way to organize a family after divorce, but that it is a recognizable and acceptable model um, for organizing custody and, and contact families after divorce. The clean break mentality suggests that the best way to help a child deal with and recover from the pains of divorcing parents is for one parent to effectively disappear. In contrast with American norms emphasized through judicial preferences for shared custody, this logic tries to minimize the tremendous social, psychological, and emotional work that a child would have to do while shuttling between two parental homes meeting new step-parents and siblings, explaining their unusual family situation, or mediating between two fighting parents. When I've presented this work, I've noticed that sometimes it can be difficult for people, for some people, to notice the labor involved in making joint custody work. I'm sure people in this room have had experience with this. I'm not trying to imply that you haven't had this experience, whether yourself or a loved one, um, or maybe you're in the midst of it now. Um, in order to sort of bring home this point, I want to talk about a moment um, when I was actually uh, at, a, at, a, at a different institution. Um, I was walking into my office building and I ran into a colleague um, who is also an American holding a small, full plastic bag. I asked her, what did she have? And she explained it was a bag of socks. Before I had time, I think, I, yeah. Uh, before I had time to make fun of her for carrying around a bag of socks, she explained more. She and her former husband had gotten divorced a decade before, and since that time, their only child, a son, had been splitting his time between each week between their houses. I think the arrangement was something like Monday and Wednesday at his mom's, Tuesdays and Thursday nights at his dad, and then alternating weekends. It's kind of complicated, which is not unusual in an American context, right? Don't know the specific details, but I do know that the schedule was pretty complicated. Throughout all this moving between houses, their son inevitably ends up splitting up pairs of socks, 
leaving one socket as dad and the partner socket as mom's. It's kind of overwrought. Like, I know you probably think I made this up. I didn't make this up. I was like, what's in your bag? And then it turned into this whole thing about divorce and separated families. And I was like, I can't move around my life without stuff, like this stuff hits me in the face, right? So once every six months or so, these parents meet up to match the socks back up, a feat made even more remarkable because of the acrimoniousness of this divorce. I cannot tell you how terrible this divorce was. It was awful. Everybody hates each other. Theirs was a truly terrible divorce. Maybe not fully nuclear, but pretty bad. When I tell this story to Japanese parents, many of them laugh and shake their heads. This would never happen in Japan, people have told me, even though I can imagine that something similar is probably already happening in Japan. It would be annoying, mendoksai, to have to maintain a relationship with a former spouse, especially one with whom you've had such a terrible and prolonged fight and of course this is true, right? This is terrible. I don't know if you've ever done this or ever watched someone else. This is terrible to have to maintain these kinds of relationships. For these two American parents, the awkward, annoying nature of having to talk on the phone to discuss their son's needs, negotiate paying college tuition, or meeting up to match socks because he can't keep the socks together, oh my God, is ultimately worth it. My point here is not to emphasize that they are necessarily better at divorce or at parenting, but to get us all to notice the work that is happening here, the labor that is necessary. I really think that for many Americans, and I'm not assuming everyone in the room is American, this kind of labor is kind of invisible. It's just assumed to be the kind of thing that you have to do. This is, this is the right way, the best way perhaps to be, um, you should at least aspire to have this kind of connection after divorce. A recent national survey in Japan found that about 40% um, of children have zero contact. Oh, sorry. I think when we converted the slides over, it got cut off. I'll, I'll read it. Um, so 2014 National Survey says that about 40% of children in Japan have no contact, no talking with, no visiting, no money from their non-custodial parent. A figure that means tens of thousands of children each year lose contact with a parent. Um, referring to a common method of construction, building construction in Japan, sociologist Shinji Nozawa evocatively calls this pattern, quote, scrap and build families. He's a genius if you ever want to read. He writes in English as well. Scrap and build is a, is a, is a building technique, um, especially used in urban Japan, where you basically completely scrap a building and then rebuild it in the same spot. And you kind of put up these little curtains so that the scrap and rebuild can happen in the same small lot, right? And what uh, Shinji Nozawa is saying is this is a model for, I mean, an unintentional model for Japanese families, that it's people believe that the best way to have a family is to basically destroy, completely ignore, completely separate from the first family so that you can rebuild. This is the opposite of a kind of American blended family model, right, and say, okay, well, I um, I'm have a relationship with my father's, you know, new wife's daughter, so that's my stepsister or step-half-sister, right, like all of that kind of blending. Um, because more than 80% of custody is currently awarded to mothers, this means that fathers are the ones most likely to be without contact with their children. Although it remains recognizable, this model for kinship is increasingly being called into question by activists attempting to change Japanese family law, as well as popular ideas about what makes a normal or ideal family. Various groups of mostly non-custodial Japanese fathers have been organizing to create a joint custody option in the family court system. So these are some protests. The, one, the pictures on the left are um, occurring within Japan. Um, the picture on the bottom right, as you can probably guess, is occurring in, in Washington, D.C. And this is a kind of, um, one of the images, this is an, an allusion to Rachi. The, this is um, the Japanese in the middle um, is alluding to the abduction problem. They're using the same word, um, that the sort of North Korean abductions. Um, so there's a lot to be said about that. These fathers and a few mothers and grandparents quite, are quite literally protesting the clean break model for divorced parents post-divorce parenting, arguing that children are best served by having relationships with both parents, right? As they say on the side, kids love both parents. At their rallies, one group holds signs saying children love both parents, hands out balloons with joint custody for children, and are in general trying to change public opinion by publicizing their own pain. 
Um, so you can see this is um, outside of Sakaragicho in Yokohama, um, which is a very sort of popular shopping area. Um, it was around Christmas, which is why they're dressed as Santa Claus. That's not a normal thing. Um, and you can see most of the signage is in Japanese. Um, the poster with images are all children, um, parents with children who they haven't been able to see anymore. Um, and they're very clever. This group is very smart. You can see at the table they have um, like a little gifts for kids. Um, and you can draw, you can put a, um, there's a Christmas tree just at a frame on the left side. And so people could write what their wishes or something like that and put it on the tree. And what they're actually trying to do here is inform parents um, of family law uh, in Japan, because many parents they find don't know that there's no joint custody, so don't know that if you get divorced, you should you should um, protect yourself in this way. So what they're doing is they often hand out balloons or other little gifts to kind of entice, and I don't mean that in a creepy way, but to, to pull in families with small children as they walk by and say, hey, can I just help you understand this, right? Um, and the stakes are obviously really, really high. And here's a balloon um, at a different rally on a different day. Um, all right. Um, other activists have written memoirs and books for children um, who ha no longer have contact with one parent. So here's a close-up of the same. So um, this is a memoir of, written by a father who doesn't see his own child, doesn't get to visit his own child. And this is a children's book um, written. Um, it's not the best translation, but things I want to tell my dad who I can't see. Um, so that there is not a huge market, but there are people who are trying to help children who are in this kind of situation. These activist efforts were, for many years, focused on getting Japan to sign the Hague Convention on the civil aspects of international child abduction, the standard international agreement addressing only the international abductions. The convention provides a mechanism to return any child moved across international borders. The agreement, which in effect in Japan since April of 20, uh, 2014, does not pertain to children moved within Japan, no matter where their parents hold citizenship, nor to children moved before Japan's accession to the Hague Agreement, before this date on 20, in 2014. The Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of Child Abduction was originally designed to quickly return abducted children to their homes and to their left-behind parents. Signatory nations, pictured here in blue, and Japan was just coming online, Japan is, is included too, to this convention, promised to use national and local law enforcement to find any abducted child and, after a hearing with a local authority, return the child to their, quote, habitual place of residence or where they had been living before their abduction. What counts as a habitual place of residence and how long it takes to make a place habitual are some of the contested questions in extant cases. I don't know if anyone is paying attention to Joe Jonas's divorce. Does anybody know what I'm about to say? Anybody care? Do you care? Can we be friends? Two of you care. You know. OK. I don't know. If, OK. So this actually, all my little divorce spidey senses went off because Joe Jonas is getting divorced from Sophie, what's her last name? Turner from Game of Thrones. And <laughs> I'm sorry. Did we all just become friends? This is great. So she is a British citizen, he's an American citizen, and the Hague Convention was just invoked around their children's custody. It seems like it's okay for now, um, but I'm just trying to relate <laughs> if anybody cares about the Jonases um, and their var various marriages. Um, this is exactly what they're talking about. The rest of you can just ignore everything I just said. <laughs> um, okay, so in that hearing, the Hague hearing, or the Hague court hearing, the local authority can determine if the habitual place of residence is a violent household or with a violent parent and therefore prevent a return. So it's not always an automatic return. When the convention was designed and planned in the late 1970s, the authors imagined a typical abduction would involve a non-custodial father taking a child from a custodial mother. This is the not without my daughter scenario. For those of you who remember the 1980s, this is a movie starring Sally Field based on a true story where she, this mother, American, white American mother goes to Iran to recover her child. So she was a custodial mother, non-custodial father, took the child to Iran, and then she had to go and rescue her. So this is exactly what they were thinking about. In the current moment, many Hague cases involve what might be seen as the inverse, custodial mothers fleeing with children from situations that they describe as violent. In the original writing, abductors were expected to be the bad guys, with gender very much assumed, 
which has made it harder for the convention to deal with cases with, in which abducting mothers claim they are fleeing violent homes. Activists have organized themselves in a number of different civil society groups with overlapping but not identical goals. Groups located outside of Japan, for instance, are more focused on using diplomatic pressure um, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to force changes in the Japanese family court system, while groups in Japan seem more intent on informing the Japanese public of what is occurring. Many, if not all, groups offer triage, legal support, and support for frantic parents whose children have just been taken. Among this diverse population of activists, widely diverging cultural perspectives, preferences, and access to power mean that activists do not always share the same motivations, methods, or desired outcomes. Um, so for instance, this is Vincent uh, Fichot, as a Frenchman who you might remember um, was staging a hunger strike um, because his children were abducted by his Japanese wife within Japan. This is right around the Tokyo Olympics in the summer of 2021. Um, and he is a, uh, was st living outside and not eating and trying to, again, sort of both gain custody or gain visitation with his children um, and also bring some publicity to the situation. Um, the Washington Post has actually been uh, publishing a lot of stories around these topics. Um, so this is from uh, fall of 2020. Um, again, just sort of publicizing. You can see there are um, Japanese parents probably and foreign parents as well based in Japan pushing for these changes. Although they correctly argue um, that although the Hague Convention might eventually help non-Japanese parents or children who are moved across international borders, the vast majority of abducted children are removed from domestic households. <clears throat> although international parental abductions are more likely to receive media and political attention, they are far fewer in number than the Japanese children who are forcibly removed from relationships with a one parent, mostly fathers, every year. Indeed, the contrast between attention parallels my own entry into this project and set of topics. I was drawn into the international cases because a staff member um, from US Congressman Chris Smith, oh, sorry, I forgot to go back. So Chris Smith is the person who's actually speaking um, at the podium right there. Um, so a staff member from his office called me to, and asked why there were so many cases around abduction going to Japan. Um, I think truly at that point, if you Google divorce in Japan, my name came up pretty quickly. Um, in an effort to answer that question fully and to understand what was going on, I wrote a research proposal to focus on international abduction cases involving Japan. Only after I got funding, went to Japan, and spent many months into field work, did I realize that the international cases are basically a drop in the bucket compared to domestic abductions occurring entirely within Japan and with two Japanese spouses. It's probably really obvious now, but I'm trying to be honest and say it wasn't obvious to me then. I don't think it was only my American perspectives that made the international cases loom larger. And it is to Japanese activists' credit that increasing attention is being paid to the need for family law reform. As one example of global attention to Japanese custody laws, I'd like to share a short clip from a recent Australian news story. This is from 60 Minutes Australia. Um, and it's about one minute long, and hopefully the audio will work. Here it is. You'll likely find this crazy, but in Japan, it's legal to kidnap children. Yes, legal. A bizarre law allows for a disgruntled parent who separates from their spouse to then literally abduct their kids and run off into the night. If there's dispute, Co-parenting doesn't exist in Japan. The mother or father who was last living with the children is automatically awarded sole custody. Now, while other countries are free to make up their own rules, no matter how strange, in this case, there are 82 Australian kids innocently caught up in the mess. In a joint 60 Minutes Sydney Morning Herald and Age Investigation, North Asia correspondent Eric Bagshaw reports that the seemingly sensible idea of shared custody is as alien to the Japanese as a ban on whaling. Okay, so that was just the intro. That's literally the start of the show. Any comments or reactions, feelings? Yeah. Is anyone Australian in this room? 
All right, I shared I shared a version of this clip with somebody, and I was like, "Ban on whaling!" It like made me laugh out loud. I was like, "Okay, does that make it like it? It feels pretty random. Is that fair to say?" And the Australian, my Australian colleague was like, "No, it doesn't. Like that's such a strong association in Australia with Japan that it 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 is it it makes a lot more sense." Um, anybody else? Any thoughts? Okay, it's not a trick question. I'm sorry if I'm scaring you. I don't mean to scare you. Um, all right. You likely f great. There's a lot going on in this short introduction, <laughs> so I'd like to unpack a little bit of it. From Jump, the story frames Japan as crazy. This might sound crazy is literally the first thing she says, and isolated. Literally beginning with, you'll probably find this crazy, but perhaps the font jumped out at you too. They're using this so-called wonton um, font, right? Can this font be racist? Is a sort of a series of articles, right? You know what this is. Um, and it all builds to a comparison with Japanese whaling. For our purposes, thinking about Japan in a global context, a transnational context, child custody laws might be beginning to draw attention similar to whaling or to the, perhaps the release of water into the ocean from Fukushima, like these sort of big geopolitical international issues at the moment. Perhaps the, world, the word crazy feels correct to you, but as a characterization, it jumped out at me. If pressed, I would say that all family law is likely crazy, especially for any person or family that deviates even slightly from the legal norm. It's really crazy if, if law doesn't work for you. At one point in this research, an Australian left behind father was telling me about his experience. He had been married to a Japanese woman and had a child before their marriage started to have troubles. In our interview, he was described his wife as becoming mentally ill, quote, going crazy, he said, and tried to offer evidence of what that was to me in this interview. As he told me, his prime example that his wife had gone crazy was that she wanted to sleep in the same bed with their child. When this man refused co-sleeping, his wife moved into the child's room to sleep with him there. Honestly, no moment of doing this research has been fun or easy, but when he told me this, all my blood rushed to my feet when I realized what he was telling me. So those of you who know Japan and work in Japan see this immediately, right? Co-sleeping with children is such a strong cultural norm that it almost feels absurd to assert it. It is normal. It is what almost everyone does. It is the unmarked norm. I'm not saying people don't vary. Of course people vary, but like as something I, I, I'm trying to, I've, I struggle, like, I struggle. I was like, oh my God, he thinks this is crazy. In the moment of listening to this man tell this story, I was heartbroken to realize that he had mistaken culture for mental illness and apparently didn't communicate well enough with his wife to figure out what was going on. I have since heard exactly this example shared by other non-Japanese parents as evidence of a fully broken marriage or delusional spouse. This is like, taking off your shoes when you come in the house. Does that make sense? Like it's just such a, it's such a normal thing to be able to do. I hope it is clear that I am not defending Japanese family law structures. I think it would be great if joint custody becomes a legally supported option. And I'm so deeply impressed with the many divorced parents who are already working so hard to make the best choices for their children. But if and when joint custody becomes a legal option, other complex family problems will continue. In every single one of the parental abduction cases I've described in today's presentation, there have been accusations of domestic violence. Almost always taking parents, accused left behind parents of committed, committing violence, and quite often they're also counter accusations. This whole project is swimming in accusations of domestic violence. I don't mean to, that to sound glib. The vast majority of parental abduction cases include accusations of domestic violence. Most commonly, abducting parents attempt to explain their actions as a rescue from violence. In ja the Japanese popular imagination, if I can speak in very general terms, parental abductions are so firmly linked with domestic violence that when I mentioned this research topic to strangers, many confidently asserted that all left behind parents are abusers. In this perspective, abducting parents are res rescuing themselves and their children and therefore, all abductions are justified and necessary. Parental activists 
particularly left behind fathers, are similarly accustomed to assumptions linking abductions with domestic violence or intimate partner violence. I'm sorry, I'm using the J Japanese terminology of DV and described perpetual attempts to clear their names. Feminist activism against joint custody in Japan is focused on precisely this point. In light of ineffective laws around intimate partner violence, if police and prosecutors are less willing to take those cases seriously, women especially need a mechanism to fully disconnect, to fully escape. When I spoke with Japanese lawyers, judges, and prosecutors, the people who, the prosecutors in Japan are the people who investigate cases, so they're sort of like police detectives in the US. Um, and they also prosecute them in court. So they're like detectives plus lawyers. These people confirmed that domestic violence cases are very hard to handle in a just an, a manner. They explained that evidentiary requirements make domestic violence accusations a potent but slippery claim in family disputes. With no requirement for, for criminal investigation, such accusations are validated or dismissed on the opinion of judges, in turn shaped by prosecutors' recommendations. Contradicting left behind parents' expectations, what they told me at least. Many prosecutors are deeply committed to trying to reduce domestic violence, but often see law as a poor mechanism with which to do so. They feel underprepared to sufficiently investigate domestic violence and therefore use the limited means under their control. For instance, holding a suspect who has been accused of violence in custody for 10 days to give um, their su survivor victim time to escape. So um, they want to enable family members to find a solution on their own. Through these choices, the prosecutors and judges most able to leverage law to address family conflicts instead imagine it to be fundamentally ineffectual. To drive this point home, one young woman prosecutor told me about the hierarchy of cases that new prosecutors are brought into. These are, these are police, not prosecutors, but they work together. The intention was that new prosecutors get put on the, quote, easiest cases first, working their way up to the hardest. In her experience, the easiest, so-called easiest first cases were all family conflicts. And the hardest cases were, anybody want to guess what the hardest cases were? Stru supposedly hardest cases. Yakuza, gang cases. So sort of crime syndicates cases. She told me very clearly that despite this set hierarchy, nothing is more complicated than a family case, especially one involving violence. As she explained it to me, in those cases, you really can't rely on the victim survivor to testify against the person who harmed them. And many cases fall apart because the survivor refuses to cooperate. There are many, many valid reasons why a survivor might decide not to cooperate. Her own safety being just one of them. But this prosecutor's point stands. Everyday family conflicts might very well be more complicated and harder to prosecute than the most, most complex criminal syndicate. I'm almost finished. This paradoxical disconnection and fundamental imbrication between family law and the rest of law situates Japanese, Japan firmly within the common pattern of family law exceptionalism. Oh, nuts. Uh, I'll read it to you. This term uh, describes how, in many different cultural contexts, scholars find legal, found legal professionals, such as judges and lawyers, and potential litigants quick to exclude family conflicts from the legal realm. So many, many, many people don't think that you should go to the court system to solve your family problems. Probably us in this room might think this too. Haley and Riddich summarize these patterns by saying the quote that unfortunately got cut off. Family and family law are often treated as occupying a unique and autonomous domain as exceptional. Despite laws seeming disinterest in interpersonal relations, relations in various cultural contexts, family law exceptionalism is no less constructed for being so common. You can see this happening across different cultural contexts. And such ma exclusions manifest a wide range of social results. Not only in Japan are family conflicts treated differently from other conflicts. Over the last few years, especially, the Ministry of Justice has organized committees to explore the possibilities for joint custody, and it remains a deeply, vibrantly controversial topic. So much so that I actually tried to put together a panel 
Um, and multiple scholars in Japan told me this is too controversial a topic. I don't really want to talk about it right now in public, which I have to say truly surprised me. At this moment, we are in the midst of possible legal changes. While I'm cautiously optimistic that there will be more legal support for shared custody and more general support for family members as they navigate these almost impossibly complicated, stressful, and upsetting situations, I'm also aware of the limits of help offered by the law. Thank you. I would love to hear comments or questions or ideas or emotional reactions. Of course. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, stand here. Okay. I think I'm. I'm in, I'm on the camera now. Oh, sure, whatever, you, you do it, yeah. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for such a, a wonderful presentation. Thank and you, also really welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so, so, so good to see yeah. you. And um, uh, I have a question on the laws. Okay. This, uh, relating to laws, and I, I work on land and politics of land, and laws around land, and then there's a debate about how to govern the commons, the common yeah. land, and yeah. oftentimes there's order without law, and the law is always there, and the community-led kind yeah. of community-led ways to um, solve problems. Yeah. So uh, Japan is, is, a, is a big country, so I wonder if there's a diverse way of um, kind of uh, resolve some of these issues if, from, say, not not resorting to law, le legal language. So outside of law. Uh, outside of law. Sure. I wonder if, let's say, different communities um, find different ways. And uh, because if you, I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, um, Eleanor Ostrom's work mm -hmm. uh, uh, on how to govern the commons, and yep. it's kind of in relation to how to how to um, solve like this uh, this this problem, and yeah. then we we tend to think of law as this you know um, resource that can solve problems, but a lot of the uh, problems are solved in this kind of uh, very diverse, also communal, community led, yeah. and so I was wondering about if yeah. we uh, if you have found anything like that. So and sh maybe I should repeat the question. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, I have also dealt with Zoom. <laughs> um, so to repeat the question, as I understand it, um, first of all, how is how are there diversities of responses um, across Japan, across different kinds of communities? So regionally, um, maybe in terms of social class, things like that, right? Ethnicity, first of all, and also you're bringing up you're bringing up. Um, uh, Ellickson's work about um, order without law. So how do we, which actually is in a different version of this presentation, surprising no one. Um, so how do people solve problems in general, thinking without resorting to formal legal structures? Um, and also you're bringing up the idea of the common, so sort of common resources or, or common values, things like that, right? Am I getting that right? OK, great. Um, so the, let me answer the, the sort of diversity across Japan point. Yes, of course there is. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the way that Japan organizes its formal legal system, which I know is not exactly the question, but I want to say this, is that um, judges are actually rotated. So um, that's not to say that there isn't variation, but um, <laughs> when, when I'm in Japan and people are like, oh, what's divorce law like in America? And I have to say, actually, it depends on what state you're in. And they look at me like, what? Why would it, why is there not any national, right? And so, so there is national law in Japan. And judges are, um, the structure of judge, Mark West has written about this um, actually a lot. The, the structure of how judges are employed and moved around is intentionally designed to keep them isolated from the community at large. Um, so they tend to live in neighborhoods with other judges. Um, they tend to, uh, uh, a daughter, assuming that people are straight, a daughter of a judge tends to marry an, a younger judge, right? Like there's this kind of um, 
separation and the intention is sort of like Japanese public school teachers, if that means anything to anybody, um, judges are actually rotated around the country so that you never really get too close to anybody, right? So um, like the Japanese public education system, there's a kind of more intended uniformity than there is in a place like the US. And maybe the US is so far on the other extreme that it's not even a helpful comparison. So it's the first thing to say. Um, in terms of other solutions, yes, absolutely. Um, people don't want to go to the law. Sorry, many, many, many Japanese people with whom I've spoken about these topics do not want to go into the formal legal system to solve these problems. Everything about it feels wrong and disgusting to them, right? So they have, and I mean, they broadly have many different mechanisms for figuring out these problems. Um, one of the things that's happening in this research is that, um, to simplify it, people with very different legal consciousness. Um, in, in Japanese, you would say hoishiki, so the consciousness around law, a sense of law, um, we might say legal ideologies, right? People with very different legal, legal ideologies are encountering each other and trying to solve problems, maybe not together, but problems that might be solved, but might be shared. Um, so for instance, um, I remember, and this is me being so American, so brace yourself. Um, I remember hearing a story from a woman whose kids were abducted, it's kind of standard story, and um, her solution, she's Japanese, her solution was to reach out to her former brother-in-law. So she was already divorced. And I was like, I mean, I don't mean to be rude, I was like, okay. Like, and she's like, yeah, and it worked. Because the brother bullied, pressured, whatever, peer pressured his brother, to be like, hey, this is really fucking unacceptable, excuse my language, but like, this is really not okay. Um, and it worked, and she got the kids back. And my American brain was blown. <laughs> I shouldn't have been. I'm, I'm maybe being too honest with you all, I'm sorry. Uh, but I was like, oh my God, it really works. Um, and what I think was so amazing to me about that is that it wasn't, it wasn't her own family member, Exactly, like I don't know how we want to say it, but it was her. She's reaching out to her ex brother in law, and he was able to do it. So I don't know if that gives you, but so people, the majority of people trying to solve this kind of issue are using those kinds of informal laws. But part of what I, what I write about when I write about um, order without law is to say that even within the Japanese family court system, when you're in the formal space, um, the, the system is structured to get you to solve problems on your own. So there isn't, there isn't as much uh, sort of interventional support. Like the language I keep wanting to use, and I don't know if it works, is like the law in Japan doesn't want to reach into a family. Um, and if I may say, I actually just realized I have some slides, I prepared a few extras. Let's see, oh, this, I'm sorry, I should have warned you, there's a gun. Does anybody know what this is? Does this, anybody else, do you, do you mind telling us what you remember? I remember it being a big story when I was young. I'm trying to remember the name, but I believe it's Robert Cuban. 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 Yeah. Cuban. Yeah. This is Ilian Gonzalez. So I promise you I'm trying to answer your question. I'm responding to your question. Is there something wrong? No, no, absolutely. There's just someone from the oh, webinar. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, what I think is going on um, is that, so if the Japanese family court system said, okay, fine, um, you know, person A is supposed to get custody and person B, his father B has taken the children, that's not allowed. What you end up having to do is then enforcing that, right? And to enforce a recovery of a child could mean something as violent as this, which was um, Ilian Gonzalez, who was the young boy who's being held by an uncle actually was brought from Cuba to Florida by his mother, who unfortunately died on the journey. Um, he, he then was taken in by his mother's relatives who had been living in the US, in Miami, um, and one, they wanted to keep him. Um, they said it would be better in the US for all sorts of reasons, like all of the politics here. This is 1993, I think. Janet Reno was definitely um, the attorney general. Um, his father lived in Cuba, and his father said, no, he's my kid. Um, I need him back. So because the U.S., um, I don't know how to say it, supported that, they had to do something as violent as this. Nobody was killed. They, they recovered. They used at least the threat of violence, right, to recover his child. He was hiding in a closet. His uncle had picked him up. This picture wins a Pulitzer Prize um, the next year. I mean, rightfully so, right? Um, 
and they return him. He's now, he's like 25 years old. He's living in Havana. He's doing fine, I think. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that when you have a court system that uh, imagines that some relationships or some abductions have to be repaired and have to be recovered, you open up the possibility for this, right? And that's why I think a lot of people in Japan really don't want this. Like, this is terrible too, right? Um, okay, does that begin to answer? I'm sorry, I'm really trying. Okay, okay. Do you have a hand? Oh, Alana, are you calling on people or am I calling on people? Okay, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll go to this. Okay, uh, thank you for that talk. That was really fascinating. Um, and I feel like it's also kind of uh, linked back to a lot of sort of you know, pop culture references about very gender imaginations of, you know, housewives fleeing houses or all these crazy stories about, you know, like, oh, we were, we were lovers, but actually we were brothers or sisters or like not knowing we had common parent, all of that. Um, I'm, I'm curious when this activism actually has started, um, from what context this idea of um, change needs to be made in terms of how family law is imagined has sort of um, initiated and like, the, the joining of the convention and all of that, like from what context has this, you know, um, enable this shift? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I'll just repeat it briefly in case people couldn't hear, but I think you did a great job. Um, so how long from at what, at what moment in history, um, why did activists begin sort of pushing for these changes in joint custody? Am I getting that right? Yes, I see. Um, the answer is um, there are it's it's coming from a lot of different people in a lot of different directions. So I'm going to try to sort of explain those directions. Um, foreign parents um, have been trying to, and by foreign I mean non-Japanese parents, um, have been trying to exert pressure um, on Japan to sign the Hague Convention for I'd say at, at least 15 years before it did. Um, the U.S. is a signatory to that, but um, there are other international agreements that the US hasn't signed for very political reasons, like the international, um, like human rights of children, the US I don't think has signed. So it's not like the US has a, a moral high ground <laughs> in terms of international agreements, right? Um, so foreign fathers were pushing for that. Um, that comes, that kind of force typically comes through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so it's sort of the equivalent of the Japanese State Department. Um, so this is a government ministry that's focused on building relationships with other countries, governments of other countries. Um, and so you could see, like I, I spent a lot of time working with, with politicians um, and with um, ambassador type people, like the support staff for ambassadors. And so you've got basically like French people who come to Japan have this kind of experience and then they're going back to the French government and saying, why don't we have a trade embargo with Japan? I mean, they're, I'm not saying that's extreme, but they're trying to, they're trying to say these really big things and sort of exerting pressure um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to say, okay, if you want to trade with the US, you have to acknowledge, or Australia, especially in the last six months, has been really sort of pushing on this. So like global pressure, international pressure related to things like politics and trade. The trick is, um, there's also the, the Ministry of Justice, which is the organization within the Japanese government that controls the court system. Um, in general, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, if we could say it, is more open to sort of more progressive international perspectives than the Ministry of Justice, who I think is sort of stereotypically presented as a very conservative ministry. Um, so just, you know, no same -se legal same-sex marriage in Japan, no joint custody, um, actually, there was just a ruling yesterday about trans people. If you, if you want me to talk about talk about that, I'm happy to. Yesterday or the day before, um, so the the legal system itself is often very conservative and saying actually only people can only have families in this very narrow way. Um, many activists within Japan see quite logically the Ministry of Foreign Affairs doesn't care. I mean, doesn't really care about them because they're not foreigners. Um, so they're pushing for legal changes within the court system. Um, Kind of fascinatingly, I'm not quite sure how to write about this yet. Um, many of these groups don't get along very well. Um, and I, I forgive the analogy, it started to sort of feel like fraternities to me, like frats, because they all felt like they weren't completely dissimilar, like they were sort of all of the same type, but they would say these really nasty things about each other to me, right? So one of the things that was happening is um, there is a, there are suspicions um, between Japanese parents, left behind parents, and non-Japanese parents, some, not all, 
um, specifically around sort of nationalism. Um, I had people tell me that foreign fathers especially didn't trust me because I speak Japanese, um, which strike, struck me as really interesting. Um, or something else I can say. And so sort of they're, they're disagreeing with each other about how to effectively make advocate for the changes that they all want to make. I did. I wrote a little bit about this in an article that's already published. If you want to read more, what I'm arguing there is that um, basically left behind fathers. In this case, I'm talking about fathers or parents that maybe um, who are really good at making a ruckus, like drawing attention to themselves, like Vincent Fouché, the French person who was doing that, um, are are better at pushing for kind of general general change but actually often end up losing any possible contact for in their own personal case. So he doesn't get to see his kids. The people I know who get to see their kids are very quiet about it. They're not trying to like kick up a big stink. They understand, okay, you hold all the power. That sucks. I'm not going to scream about it. I'm just going to say, I'm going to, for lack of a better word, try to keep you happy so that I can see my kids once a month or something like that. I'm not saying one method or is better or worse but that it does seem to have um, dramatically different impacts for the personal cases versus the sort of general movement. Um, and that doesn't sort of correlate directly to nationality or gender or anything like that. Does that begin to answer your question? OK. Um, so the last 15 years, what I should have said is in the last 15 years, that's it. Yeah. Um, yes, please. And then I'll go to the question from Jennifer on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you for the um, st stimulating talk. I have two questions. One is out of my curiosity. I was wondering about uh, the financial obligations yeah. after divorce, um, whether um, those who um, doesn't have the custody right have the financial obligation um, you know, for uh, the child yeah. or the children. Um, um, Second question um, is that it seems, you know, from a, a kind of naive-minded feminist um, perspective, I feel like, wow, this is a protecting women because, you know, as a chart you showed, um, you know, um, the majority of the cases, it, it was the mother who uh, got keep the, the children, right? Um, you know, you also mentioned the feminist, um, you know, op opposition to the change of the law. Yes. Right? Um, so I was wondering, um, is there, um, is there a way to kind of, um, you know, to, for the two, two sides to reach a kind of agreement? You know, on the one hand, it was, um, you know, the Japanese feminist or part of the Japanese feminist movement. On the other hand, it was um, those who um, push for, um, you know, the basic human rights of parent, parenting. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I might take your second question first, if yes, it's okay sure. with you. Um, thank you very much. So thinking about a possibility of um, bringing sort of the two sides or the two extremes together and specifically noticing the feminist um, aspects of this um, and that the need that women, mostly custodial parents, women um, need help, they need protection. Um, yeah, so joint custody, uh, uh, a lack of support for joint custody is a very strong feminist issue in Japan. Um, very many sort of formal feminist organizations don't want joint custody um, because, I mean, I was trying to sort of get to it with the sock story, but because if you think about it, a lot of that work will fall to um, the custodial parent. We know that women tend to be custodial parents. Um, we also know um, that women have a much lower uh, sort of an average annual income, right? Um, so, so it's legal in Japan to, to say that you don't want to hire someone over the age of 35, you can post that and say, so it's very hard for women who have custody of their children um, to have jobs that allow them both to make enough money to survive and to have a, a flexible enough schedule um, that they can help their kids, right? So you can get a part-time job or a low-paying job that gives you the flexibility, but then you, you know, can't afford your life, right? Um, so this is a very serious issue. Um, I think from, from my semi-outsider's perspective, the way to kind of uh, meet in the middle would be to offer serious protections against intimate partner violence, right? Um, because right now, in a kind of jerry-rigged kind of way, people are using custody, sole custody, as a way to escape from and protect against further 
intimate partner violence. So if there was another solution, and I'm not quite saying law, but if there was another solution that offered that shield, um, or another set of practices even that offered that shield, I could see that get it moving as closer to a possible compromise, which is what I'm hearing you ask about. Um, there are lots of people who share custody. I know children in Japan or older people who've grown out, out of, the, but like people who sort of moved between two families as they were growing up, but it's not so common. Um, and so we also have to take into account that it, it, it I don't want to say it's purely stigma, that's not the case, but it's something that needs to be explained, which is Goffman's old definition of stigma, right? Like, so a kid who's just moving between two families, um, moving between dad's house and mom's house, um, might have to explain themselves in Japan in a way that they don't quite have to as much in the US. So even that alone is hard. Um, financial obligation. Um, in the same way that there are very few effective enforcement mechanisms around all the stuff that we've talked about, there are very few inf effective enforcement mechanisms um, around financial obligation. So many people, two things happen. Um, many people make financial obligation statements, um, promises, um, and these are often coupled with visit, what we might call visitation, right? And say, okay, well, you're gonna pay whatever, a thousand, equivalent $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month, and, I'll, and you'll see the kid every two weeks. Um, if either side reneges on that offer or that promise, there's very little uh, mechanism to force them back into it, right? So in the US, you could hold someone in contempt of court that doesn't exist in this kind of way in Japan. Um, so financial obligations are like custody, like visitation, um, sort of uh, on the, the people themselves to hold up their promise. So to go back to your question, you can use social pressure to force that to happen, right? You can um, get get your ex-brother-in-law to call up his brother and be like, hey, dude, you really have to start paying. Like, they can't afford food, right? But, but in terms of turning to the formal law, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at you now when I say formal law, to turning to the formal law to solve it, it's very hard to do. Um, so it can be done, but not in the system, and especially for foreigners who have that expectation, right? That like law is, is a tool that you can use to get what you need. That's not there. Um, wait, there was one other thing I wanted to tell you. Oh, um, this is kind of a bummer. Um, many people who are getting divorced will actually basically, women who wanna get divorced, and you can imagine especially people who are dealing with a violent situation, actually basically bribe their, their husband to agree to the divorce by, by not asking for any financial obligation. So um, a not in, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but a not insignificant number, I wanna say in the 70s, 60 to 70% of people um, who are desiring the divorce, if you have a spouse who can say, no, I won't give you the divorce, then you can say, uh, as a negotiating strategy, say, okay, I don't want the money. You can, you can have the house, you can have the car, you can do whatever. So there is a way, uh, there's a lot of very clear statistical and demographic evidence that the people who are in, let's call it the worst marriages, the most violent marriages, are actually not even asking for a financial obligation because they just, they want that clean break. They don't, they don't wanna have anything. Um, or sometimes they ask for a one-time payment of like a million yen or so, so like $10,000 or something like that. Does that answer your question? Okay, um, may I read the question from Zoom? Um, Jennifer says, just wish to add, the two children in the first pick looks uncomfortable, tense, and hopeless, thank you. The police sitting shows no sympathy. Not sure if this was posed for picture taking. Yes, thank you, Jennifer, and I'm sorry it took me so long to read your comment. Um, I don't think it was posed. Um, he is a professional photographer, so I guess I could ask him. Um, it's, it's possible, um, so in Japan, if you find cash on the ground, you can take it, like if you find like the equivalent of a $10 bill or something, you can take it to the koban, and if you're a kid, you get like praised for your honesty, and like it's, it's kind of a little cultural moment. So it's possible that like they got lost or they found cash on the ground and like they're like being praised for their tremendous honesty. So I want to put that out there. Um, but, but I agree, like um, especially the way that he framed the picture um, with their, their being rendered anonymous, maybe partially because they're kids, but are also it kind of implies that like something, they need to be protected. Their identity needs to be protected from something. Yeah, so I'm hoping, um, I had an image I really wanted to use for my first book and really loved it. I don't know if I show this to you. And then the photographer just passed away. He was kind of elderly and he passed away. And I wrote to his, his widow and she said, um, divorce is too depressing. You can't use it. And I was like, crap. 
Um, so the picture on my is a book is a picture I took. It's fine. <laughs> but so I started looking for a book cover really early because I was like, I'm not going to lose another one. Um, so I'm really, really hoping that I'll be able to buy the rights to use it because I feel like it's a really um, evocative image. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, the presentation again. Um, my question is just, I'm curious, because um, the majority of the activism that you mentioned in this talk came from the side of the left behind parents. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not sure how long this phenomenon has been going on, but I feel like it might have been long enough for like the children who has been subjected to um, these kind of situations to yes. grow up and now be able to like talk about their experiences. Yeah. So I'm yeah just wondering if you have come across any such person in your um, field work. Thank you. Yes, thank you. What an insightful question. Thank you so much for putting that together. Yes, 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 you are absolutely right. Um, so about 50% of the time when I give a presentation about this, um, in the US or in Japan, uh, someone will come up to me afterwards and say, I was an abducted child. Um, so I actually, I had one person raise their hand and say it in the Q&A. But most people, and that's fine, I'm not making fun. Like, it's, it's, they don't have to. Um, so there are, as you can imagine from these numbers, there are many, many, many people who have been in this situation. Um, and many people, quite reasonably and correctly, understand it as a rescue um, and, and put it together later, um, and sort of like figure it out later. Um, I think that in ways that you might expect, there are people across the spectrum, they have a whole variety of feelings about this. So some people have said, basically, I realized later that my mother saved my life because she took me, she must have saved my life, something like that. I'm, I was actually, I gave this presentation uh, about, uh, not this one, but a version of something like this about a month ago. And the person who told me about their re reaction after, after, um, actually she texted me and said, can we have breakfast? And I was like, sure. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Um, I'm not making fun, you understand I'm not making fun. I'm just like, oh my God, they're everywhere. And actually I can tell you this, um, this is maybe even a, borderline funny story, I got some funding from the Japan Foundation, which is this big, you know, organization in Japan. And um, it was summer funding, I don't know, years ago for this project. And so I went to the meeting and they like, you know, they give me, they give me the deposit slip and they give me, you know, I fill out paperwork and I'm like so polite and lots of bowing and everybody's really nice. And then they take me into basically an executive's office who is somebody, this is a, um, a bureaucrat right, who's got this sort of cushy gig, working really hard at the Japan Foundation. We have a nice conversation. He's like, great luck, good luck. You know, thank you so much for your work. And I'm like, thank you so much. We talk for 30 minutes. He takes me to the elevator for my next meeting. He pushes the button and he says, oh yeah, by the way, I haven't seen my dad in 25 years. Okay, bye, and shoves me on the elevator. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, are you kidding me right now? And of course, of course, if, if these are the numbers, of course that's the case. He's probably 45 years old, you know, 10 years ago. But th this is what I'm trying to say. Like, yes, there are a lot of people. And I do not feel comfortable saying, it is not correct to say they are all sad. Um, they are not all sad. Um, some of them surely are. Some of them are um, questioning, maybe as they start to have children themselves, questioning the decisions that their parent or parents made in a different way. Um, it's not clear, very few, a few people have written um, memoirs basically um, and talked about, the, the people who tend to publish tend to, or to present publicly tend to, to present um, real unhappiness and say like, this is not what I wanted, this was not good for me, I missed my dad or I missed my mom. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of people. Does that begin to answer your question? Okay, thank you. And she just shoved me in the elevator. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.